maybe I can learn to write software. And my wife said, well, if these people are making a living writing software that doesn't work very good, you could probably make a living writing software that isn't very good. So I went ahead and started learning to program. I didn't start making my living with it till almost 15 or so years later, but I wrote a lot of software I would use for myself. About 1998, I stumbled upon this idea of pair programming that people were talking about. Some of you have seen pair programming. Two people sitting at one computer. And I was already old enough, you know, 45 years old, where uh, I would no longer say, that seems crazy, that can't work. I'd learned in my life that every time I say that, I'm gonna be proven wrong. So I instead said, that looks interesting, I'm gonna to try to do that. So it took me about two years to learn how to do that well. And by 2001 or two, it became my preferred way of working. Two programmers at one computer. Uh, there were some benefits to it. A big benefit was, uh, it was two sets of eyes, two brains on the code. So we were getting higher quality code. It was easier to solve the problems and we were getting more done than we could have gotten done separately. I liked those benefits. And then I went out to a job in late 90, well, mid 1999, where they put me on a team. And I was really excited to see how does that work? And so I went on the team, but they never did anything that you consider teamwork. Could you imagine, uh, people getting onto a basketball court. You have basketball in Finland? We do that in the US. You throw a ball up in the air. If you've got five people on the basketball court and one of them is playing football and one of them is playing tennis and one of them is playing a basketball, we're not gonna be playing the same game. We're not really a team. So I thought, why do they put me on a team and we're never doing anything like a team together? We're not teaming. And so uh, that started me thinking, why don't we do real teamwork in software development? And then every now and then I'd see teamwork. Like there's an emergency and everybody comes together in a big room, like maybe 20 people and they talk about what are we gonna do? And then they focus on that for a while and when they're done solving the problem, they go back to working alone. So I started thinking maybe we can do this a little bit more. So I'm gonna do a real quick introduction. What we're gonna do today is actually try to demonstrate I have a couple volunteers and we're gonna ask for two more volunteers from the audience. So be thinking about that now. Are you willing to get up, come up in front of everybody else and have a chance of really making a fool of yourself? There's a couple people here I'm sure who are willing to do that. It'll actually be very simple. Matter of fact, I've had people do this that were as young as nine or 10 years old. I remember at one conference, a nine-year-old came up. If a nine-year-old can do it, maybe we can do it. We're going to actually demonstrate how this works, at least in a minor way. So I've been doing this for, uh, since 2011, working as a team in my daily work. Until 2015, when the pressure came so high for me to speak at conferences and do workshops, that I switched into doing the workshops. So maybe I'll move over here. You get a more full-figured uh, photograph. <laughs> very candid. Very candid. So... Um, I've become quite used to this, but starting in 2009, before we ever worked this way, we used to do something that I'm gonna demonstrate, which we call a coding dojo, a style of coding dojo, where we all work together uh, on some simple problem, but it's more of a social activity. Often I would go to a conference and we're sitting together, uh, like here, and sitting next to someone we've never met before. And when the conference is over, we still don't know them. But when we would do the coding dojo together, all of a sudden we're making friends. And it really turned out to be a wonderful experience and I really enjoyed it. So I did as much of that as I could. A real quick introduction. Mob programming started for us in 2011 at Hunter Industries. We won't talk much about that, but it's a company where we started doing this and now it's being done all over the world. Simply put, it's all the brilliant minds working together on the same thing at the same time in the same space and at the same computer, which is very much like pair programming but with your whole team. Now, ideally, we would gather together all the skills and knowledge that we need to do our work so that we can work on everything we do directly from start to finish without having to go off the team to get knowledge that's missing. Now, that's an ideal situation. It doesn't happen often, but this is a picture of that exact thing. Let me see if I can get my pointer to work. Oh, I can. Let me see if I can get it a little better. Yep, here's a tester a product owner who happens to also be a coder, but 
uh, they worked on a different team and we were doing this work for them. So we were writing software for, for, the, for their team and we wanted to make sure that we had that knowledge sitting with us. I was a coder, another coder, a database expert, and two more coders. So everything we did is sort of code focused, but these coders aren't all equally skilled. We all have different skills. Matter of fact, his training was in AI and machine learning. My training was in the school of hard knocks, writing business software, a tester, another developer who was mostly familiar with the legacy code in the, in the company. Uh, we had maybe 30 or 40 apps we were maintaining that had been written over 20 years, 30 years period, and a kind of a new programmer who had been on the testing team and had converted to being a programmer. Uh, so we have a, a skills, all different skills needed to write this software. If we had a question, we could answer it ourselves. This is a big part of it. So we can work directly on things from start to finish. I want to keep my uh, clock nearby. Okay. It's not five people watching one person coding. If, if I sat down here and started coding and you tried to follow along, that would be some kind of bizarre uh, coding theater that nobody would enjoy for very long unless we happen to be like the super most brilliant coder in the world and you wanted to see that person working. This is not five people watching one person coding. It's five people coding through one person sitting at the keyboard. And we'll demonstrate how that works. You need techniques to do this. And the technique that I used came from pair programming. When I first learned pair programming, they described it as driver navigator. Somebody's at the keyboard driving like you're driving a car and somebody's navigating like they have the map and they say uh, in three blocks make a left turn and then we'll go down about a mile. Now we don't give much more instruction than that when we're guiding someone with a map because if we give them too much information they'll forget it by the time we get there. It's too, too much to take in and we can't give them too little information like it was that right turn back there. You know, we will tell them just in time the right amount of information. That's what driver navigator is. And that works for a group. It worked with pair programming. We have the idea of the driver. The driver is at the keyboard acting as a smart input operator. They understand the language and the lingo that we're talking. They may or may not know how to code yet. It depends on what our goals are, but they're going to learn as we go. So that person happens to be the tester, but he understood some things about coding. The rest of the team could be saying, okay, we're going to need a drop down and we're going to put, fill it with the regions. So the person at the keyboard, if they know how to do a drop down and fill it with the regions, they just do it. But if they don't, we have to give them instructions almost to the code level, but we usually try to keep the level very high, high level instructions. We need a drop down with the regions. And if the person at the keyboard can do it, they just do it. And if they can't, we give more details. So maybe they'll get to the region. Well, where do the regions come from? And somebody says, oh, there's a service for that. Or maybe somebody else says, um, oh, we need to do a database call to get that. Do people still do database calls? Do you do database calls? Or do you normally just call a service to get the data you need? Service is way more common now. When I've pro programmed, that was pre-SQL in most places. There wasn't even SQL in those days. Everybody on the team is there because of the knowledge they have. They're there to share the knowledge that they have to get us doing what we need to do. So if we have the product owner there and we have a question for the product owner, they're sitting there to help us. That's a rare situation, but that's what I try to get whenever I'm working this way. But we follow this guideline. For an idea to go from somebody's head into the computer, it must go through someone else's hands. That requires that we get good at some things, like communicating clearly, trying to understand, striving to understand, rather than attempting to um, push our ideas out. We try to each understand each other's ideas as we go. That means we want to share things in small pieces. We'll talk about that in a minute. It seems crazy. I love that word preposterous. I have a lot of trouble saying it. So I put the definition there, contrary to reason or common sense. My father, who was an engineer, electrical, electronic engineer, he used to say, I don't care about common sense. I care about unconventional wisdom. I like that. Okay. It may seem crazy, but it's being done all over the world. I've seen now, uh, I've gotten emails 
or messages or seen it in Twitter or whatever of people doing this everywhere. I haven't yet seen one from the South Pole, but hopefully someday maybe they'll be doing it there. Just quickly, you can see pictures of people all over the world, Boston, London, Alaska. Uh, pay attention, they all have slightly different setups. They, uh, but look how engaged everybody is. People often ask me, how do you keep people engaged doing this? I've never had a problem with that. We're moving fast. Imagine, again, we're playing basketball. What if you're not paying attention when you're playing basketball? What's gonna happen to you? Somebody's gonna hit you in the head with a basketball because they're gonna throw it to you thinking you're paying attention and you're not. Yeah, this is the same thing. So more teams, this particular company, in San Diego had t uh, 10, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. 10 teams, 10 teams working this way. And this particular team was doing phone support. They were programmers who would take their turn at the support desk. So they're doing team support or mob support all over the world, all over the world. Of course, I did not ever coach this team because I was six years old and they never called me. I would have gone to help them because the first thing I would have told them is, get yourself some big monitors because these monitors they're using are non-existent. But anyways, that's enough of that. It can be done remotely. So we've been doing it remotely since 2011 because we had some team members that weren't there with us. Uh, we've learned a lot about that since then. So why would we work this way? I'm gonna share a couple ideas. Um, knowledge sharing. We get a lot of knowledge sharing happening this way. Everybody on the team gets a more general understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Continuous code and design review. It's a funny thing. If we're doing design reviews infrequently, we're not going to write software that people want to use. If we're doing code reviews infrequently, we're going to be writing software we need to do a lot of rework on, not refactoring. I'm talking about we have to change things because we didn't understand in the first place. By having many perspectives on the work, hopefully all the meaningful perspectives on the work. And we would get rapid feedback. This gives us ability to focus on the right things. Now, I'm not trying to sell you on the idea of doing this. I'm purely here to share this. Matter of fact, that second slide uh, that I had up there is basically, I can't tell you what to do. I just am sharing some things that we did. It enhances the flow of the work. We won't go into detail here, but it happens because we're eliminating cues and reducing inventory. Inventory is anything we've started working on that the customer is not yet using, and that is waste. Queuing is a waste. If we're waiting 10 minutes, that's 10 minutes of waste. And most companies, people are often waiting a day or two or a week or two to get an answer to a question that's blocking them. We would get better solutions and higher quality because of this. In the three and a half years I worked at Hunter, after we started doing this, we only had three bugs reported into our bug tracking system. There was an 18 month period where we didn't get a single bug. And we believe it's because we were using this bigger mind that comes from six or eight people. Well, in our case, usually six or seven people working together at the same time. The work flows directly from start to finish. So something that would have taken days or weeks before is now getting done in two or three hours. We could just watch the stuff clicking off really rapidly. And lastly, we found it to be more fun, less stressful, and more engaging. So one thing I will warn you about, if you're doing mob programming, you've done it and you said, boy, it just exhausts me. We probably need to change how we're working. Pay attention to that. Don't let that stop you. That just means we got to pay attention to it being more, uh, less stressful, more relaxing, and it can be. Alrighty, so I'm going to talk about Wheels Low really, really quickly. Wheel, this is a Finnish professor, passed away about 10 years ago. Uh, but this is really important. I've been always looking for why does this seem to work so well? So Wheels Law, his fundamental law is communication usually fails except by accident. Now, right now, I'm communicating to you. I have no way to verify that you're understanding anything. If I were to ask you, do you understand? And you nod your head like this, I still don't know, did you understand? If you go like this, I still don't know if you didn't understand. 
There's no verification. This is really great. If communication can fail, it will. But when communication cannot fail, it still most usually is going to fail. Now, this is meant to be humorous. But these are observations that I think are kind of true. Look at this one. If communication seems to succeed as we intended it, there's been a misunderstanding. I think that's true. This one's very similar. If you're happy with your message, there's definitely been a failure to communicate. When I'm done with a talk like this, people ask, how did your talk go? I'll say, well, I don't really know because I had no way to prove that anybody understood anything. Look at this one, these next two together. If a message can be interpreted in several ways, it will be interpreted in the manner that maximizes the damage. Do any of you ever use Twitter? That's Twitter. This one's very similar. There is always someone who knows more than you what you meant with your message. <laughs> they won't even let you explain. There's two more I'll cover real quick. The more we communicate, the worse it gets. This is true, I find. Whenever somebody gives me a huge document, compared to a skimpy document, a small document, there's a lot more to misunderstand in the big document. Lastly, the more we communicate, the faster the misunderstanding spreads. You've seen Slack. Have you ever heard of Slack? Okay, so that's enough of that. Why do I bring this up? Why do I bring this up? Because I think mob programming partly addresses this. Because we have extremely rapid feedback from the people who have to be paying attention. This means we prove our communication, and we'll see that as we demonstrate it today. So that's the end of the talk. So I've tried to find the right way to say thank you. Does that look like thank you to you? Okay, what about that? Okay, and then we got this. That's the very, the very first slide I ever made with a, diff, a foreign language to me. I'm from San Diego, California. It was in 2013, and I went to do a talk in, um, in uh, Sweden. So, Taksamek. And then also, I've been to Germany and Portugal and so many other places, so we'll end it there. We're going to bring up some folks, and we're going to do a demonstration of this. So, we have a couple. Uh, please come forward, David and Laura. And then we need maybe two more uh, volunteers from the audience. Please come on up. And, oh, look at this. So, now we're going to have to arm wrestle for it. Who's going to win? We're going to arm wrestle. You know arm wrestle to see who wins. Um, please come forward. Yes. So. We might bring up one more person. We'll see how this goes. You notice here, we have something akin to a gender equality. Interesting. So I've often had it where I'm doing a workshop and I say, let's divide into teams where we're half men, half women. And it's rare to find a person who is half man, half woman, but Often the teams are going to be mostly men and a few women, so it's nice to see more women. So please, let's have a seat here. Uh, let's introduce each other. This is Laura. She has worked with me over the last few months, kind of helping put this together. And David. So David uh, and Laura both live here in Finland, but now we have some new team members. So what's your names? Uh, my name is Lynn. Lynn and? Yanka. Yanka. Can I see how that's spelled? Yanka, yeah. Polish. So we have a very international group, right? Because I'm from America, whatever that means. Uh, Finland, uh, Portugal, and I've, where maybe uh, you originate from? Uh, I'm originally from Vietnam. Vietnam? But living here. And living here now. I have a very good friend that I've spent many, many years programming with who is going to work in Vietnam right now, probably in the next month. And then you're from Poland originally. Okay, let's go ahead, if you don't mind, and take a seat here. So we'll have four people seated. Is this a good start? And let's go ahead and have um, one of you, two, take a seat at the computer. Which would you like to do? Is this good? So you're not a good typer? Is that what you're saying? You know where the, you know where the keys are, okay. <laughs> I can do it. This is a Finnish uh, keyboard. Oh, we're going to need to get it uh, permissionized. Yeah, I'll let you do this. You do it. You're going to need to get it turned on. 
what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate a coding dojo. A coding dojo is different from mob programming. Uh, I started doing coding dojos. I learned about it from the software craftsmanship group in Paris, France in 2009. And the very first experience I had with it, which happened to be in the U.S., uh, I almost immediately fell in love with this. And we, I've built out the rules a little bit to make it uh, very easy to keep from becoming chaos. And it's, how, it's sort of an introduction to how mob programming works. So we're going to see, we're gonna, you're going to watch real live. We have two people who have practiced with me a little bit and two people I've never even met before. And we're going to see how this goes. So I'm actually going to remove one chair for starters and we might remove another chair in a moment. It's like musical chairs, right? I don't know if you, do you know that game here, musical chairs? You do it at a kid's party. There'll be five or six chairs or 10 chairs and the kids all sit down and then they play the music and they walk around and they take one chair away. And then when the music stops, everybody sits down and then whoever's still standing, they're out. So you do that until there's one person and they win the prize. So we think we're ready to start. So I am going to act as the facilitator and the product owner. As a facilitator, whatever I say goes. I'm the final arbiter of any question. I will guide them through the process. We're going to do what's called an incremental kata, a very simple programming exercise. I will give an instruction up here, and then it will be the navigator's turn. With a coding dojo, we have one navigator. With mob programming, everybody except the driver is a navigator. So you can imagine, if you all got into the taxi, Let's say there's five of us, four of us that got into the taxi. And here's the taxi driver ready to take off. And they say, where are we going? And somebody says, the football stadium. Somebody yells out, no, the airport. So says, no, I want to go hiking. You're not going to get wherever. You're going to get in the taxi because you're kind of going to want to go to the same place. So we need to be organized in the directions we're giving to the person at the keyboard. Now, the program that we're going to write is a very simple kata or exercise. And this is called uh, Roman numeral... Uh, conversion. We're going to convert Arabic numerals to Roman numerals. I always like to check, are there any ancient Romans here? <laughs> okay, because I'm going to insult you if you're an ancient Roman, because I think your numbering system was iffy. Um, I think with the Romans, all they cared was, did we collect the taxes? And do we have enough soldiers to take over all of Britain? If 40,000 is enough, isn't enough, let's send 400,000. So their numbering system didn't need to be too accurate, but that's what we're going to do. So we're going to start off by with one problem, and we're going to have one navigator, and the navigator stands. And so at this time, we we'll remove this chair so that there's no temptation to sit down. So he's, David's going to be our, our navigator, and he will guide Lynn. Hopefully I remembered everybody's names. He'll guide Lynn in doing the beginnings of this exercise. So uh, when I do the exercise, we always do test-driven. When you work and you do mob programming, you do whatever you want. You don't need to do test-driven. But when I do this exercise, I do test-driven. It really, you understand what I mean, test-driven development. Anybody can nod their head. Do you understand? Yeah, we never know. But test-driven is something I've done now for 20 plus years. It's very comfortable for me. The first thing in the conversion is going to be, if we input a one, we'll get back an I. Hopefully that's big enough for everybody to see. But if you can't, use your iPhone, take a picture, and then enlarge it. Okay? So, I'll let you go ahead and start navigating. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I don't know what I'm doing, so it's even going to be worth uh, telling someone else what to do. Um, we have practiced this a bit, and uh, normally we like to start uh, writing the test first. Uh, so please, Lynn, bear with me and go to the file of the test. Yeah, bear with me. All right, uh, if you scroll a bit up, you have uh, here, here in the line five, you have the first test. Uh, so it's, uh, this is the test that we can see in the terminal that is failing. 
uh, if you go a bit up in this uh, scroll up in the terminal you will see uh, why it's failing is expecting i so how we are going to fix this test so we have to please go to the converter file so you see, we started with a little code first. I normally wouldn't, but we're limited on time. Please go ahead. And let's think about this, how we can pass this test. Uh, you don't have to think ahead and try to solve the whole problem of, you just need to focus on the test. So if it's expecting an I, how will you fix this code? So you guide her. Please. You just tell her what okay. to do. Uh, right. Uh, I in the return. It has to be a string, cannot be a number. Yeah. Uh, remove that space so there is only. And once that you save, Command S. Uh, great. Way! Okay. Now, I'd like to point out something. We now have code that does what, it has been, what is expected of it. If my boss came in right now, and said, we got to ship something today. I would say, we can ship this. It only handles one case, but we can ship this. So we have a lot of confidence in this. So let's do the next requirement. Uh, Ready? I only practiced to here. I don't know. I don't know anymore. <laughs> if we input right. a two, I want to get back two eyes. Okay. So let's do the simplest thing we can to make that pass. Always doing the simplest thing we can. I can do that, I think. Uh, Lynn, please. First. Let's go back to the test. So we write the test, we see that fails, and then we fix it. Uh, so please copy and paste the line six to nine. Copy. Yeah, copy and paste it again. So we du duplicate this block of code six to, uh, it can be inside of the describe function. So six to nine, sorry, six to eight. Uh, it should be inside of the describe function. So you can use the numbering. So the line numbers are turned on, so we can say, please pass that in, or paste that in right after nine. Yeah. Or right after eight, eight. And, and do the last, uh, and then six to eight, you can copy and paste it in the line eight and a half, as Woody eight and a half. <laughs> taught me. That tells us to go right after All eight, right. eight and a half. Uh, let's customize that those lines to fit to this requirement. You know, David doesn't need to give line by line, character by character instruction. Thank so you, Lynn. Until uh, Lynn needs it. The line 10 also has to change the you see? expectations. When you're working with a team this way, you get used to this really quickly. Really good. Now we can see the test failing, so this is a good thing. Uh, you still have 36 seconds, so make it pass. All right, uh, let's, you know what to do, Lynn. <laughs> so what would let's you like create, to do? You guide her. Let's create an if block, and we check that Arabic is... Uh, Tell her the line number to go yeah, to. Just, just before the line four. So there is, then for sure, it will be fine. I would have said four and a half. Four and a half. Yeah. But you just, you get shortcuts of communicating. It's like with anything. If Arabic. Arabic? Yeah, Arabic is the uh, parameter we're getting in the function. All right, there's our timer going off. So we rotate. So let's, oh, this is okay. So let me explain. Once we get good at this, it doesn't matter that we're right in the middle of something. Because we're going to be with this through the whole thing. So everybody stands. You sit at the, key, at the keyboard, you take the microphone. Uh, so Yanka takes the microphone and she will guide the process now. Alrighty? So do you have an idea what to do? One, two, one, two. Okay. Uh, so I imagine we, for now, it's gonna be enough to go, if Arabic is equal to one, uh, return I. Um, so you can move line five over to the previous one or make it a so, box. So, yeah, <laughs> the, we let the person at the keyboard to do whatever coding they want to do. And later, mm -hmm. we have automatic formatter. We'll just let it format. And yeah. if we don't get the code we hoped, but it gives us the same results, it's probably good enough, right? 
And now just below go if Arabic equal to uh, return I I. Yeah, now, the braces are weird on this keyboard. When we're doing the coding <laughs> dojo, the only person allowed to speak is the navigator. Please I'm, bear with us. The Finnish keyboard layout is kind of weird for, for us. So, <laughs> sorry for Yeah, me. what's with that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, and you can remove line 10 now because that's we don't need that anymore. Uh, oh, you, let's see if that works. This looks like it does. So we're not too worried about what happens when we didn't pass in a one or a two, right? That doesn't matter unless we have a requirement that requires that. But let's go ahead and add a number one, I mean, another one. Number three has to turn into three eyes. Now I'm going to ask that you do that the simplest way you possibly can. And then we'll look at doing it in a, uh, a less duplicate code style. So let's see how we do. All right, let's go over to the test and add another test case. Uh, just replace two with three and I, I with I, I, I. Now that may be a little more information than was needed. So when we're navigating, we, we kind of adjust ourselves to see how much do they really need because we all heard the same requirement. So we adjust to see how much do you need. If you give too much information, it can become uh, annoying. If you get too little information, we always have to fill in the gaps. It's something we learn over time. Yeah, always run the test as soon as you can. And how would you like to solve that? The simplest way you can. Yeah, simplest way would be just to duplicate it again and change. Well, you know what to do. <laughs> We should do a raffle to see here. Who knows how many times I've done this exercise? I don't know if I could even count, but I'm expecting that to uh, pass as it did. So I'm going to put it on pause, your turn on pause for a second, if you don't mind. Please remain standing. So when we look at our uh, code now, we see we have what I would call duplicate code, and we need to solve for that. My way of doing this, and everybody's different, but the people I learned from, and particularly later in my career, when I got to work with some really brilliant test-driven development folks, they would see this as duplication that must be removed because there's an abstraction hidden here. Now, we may not come on that instantly but because it, it can take a little thinking. Now, the people who are now what I would call observing, and in mob programming, we don't have observers. But in the coding dojo, we do. The people observing, they're just watching. They're thinking about, what would I do when it's my turn? But it's your turn right now. So, Yanka, you have to think, what do you like to do? And David's not allowed to contribute either. In the coding dojo, this is what I found. If we allow too many people to contribute, it just turns into chaos. I tried this once with 50 people, and that was extreme chaos. So I've pared it down. So now I'm going to turn your time back on. You have a lot of time, two minutes and 18 seconds. All right. Let's see, see what you can think. Uh, I'm thinking let's go if Arabic less than three. Um, so get rid of the two blocks. Oh, so uh, I'll put this on pause again. My instruction is going to be keep the code passing while you add you were, what we're going to do now is refactor. So keep it passing while it's refactoring and start adding your new code. We don't delete code until we can delete code. Does that make sense? All right. I'm so going to force that as a rule, okay? Just don't press save. Then the test doesn't run and we're still good. <laughs> All right. Let's go at the top and let's go if. But surely we can just do if Arabic less than three and less or equal. Yeah. Is somebody help from the audience? Uh, three, 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 three. Yeah, uh, return. Um, I dot repeat um, Arabic. I, uh, so uh, yeah, like this, I, and then after that, dot repeat. And then in brackets, uh, Arabic. Yeah. So I would say now you can run the tests and then delete. It may not still pass after that, but let's see what happens. 
So now you can delete. Does that make sense to everybody? This is a rather minor example, but... Um, <laughs> it's time to rotate. So everybody moves one chair over. Now the only rule I have is if the person sitting down at the keyboard has not yet moved, don't sit at the keyboard. You wait until the person at the keyboard has left, then you can sit down. Otherwise, you're sitting on their lap, and that's not so good. So we're learning the keyboard. Now, Laura is in charge of taking this to the next step. Is there, so look at that brilliant solution. Did that not work well? That is really, really nice. Clean, simple. That's... Uh, how long have you been coding in JavaScript? How many have been doing JavaScript more than 10 years? More than 10 years? More than 15 years? More than 20 years? That's the advantage of being really old. Because I've been doing it for way over 20 years. When JavaScript first came out, I used it, there wasn't such a thing as an asynchronous callback. You know what an asynchronous callback is, right? They didn't exist. When those came out, it was like, whoa, that's where all the power came. You all work with asynchronous callbacks, right? Nothing that you do would work without that. Or has that changed? Somebody will have to set me straight afterwards because I could be wrong. All righty, so we're ready to move on. You want to refactor anything? No, this is brilliant at this stage. So we are brilliant. Ready, for the, brilliant. ready for the next, next okay. requirements. So, our beautiful solution, not quite up to this one. So, let's start the timer and Laura will tell us what to do. Okay, Janka, please, uh, let's write the test for this new requirement first. Now, remember, this is not mob programming. This is a coding dojo, a sort of a social programming. So there's no need to give any instructions if you think the person's going to do it, okay. that, right? That Does it? Perfect but me. at this point, we don't say, just solve for that. That's the job of the navigator. So once mm -hmm. we give the instruction to write the test, now we have to be thinking, what are we going to do? Um, we could go back to the converter and let's keep uh, adding very like simple case, just an if, if statement, that if it's for, it returns the hard-coded value. So this, I would commonly call this a guard clause because it's a case that's beyond the common case we have. So we guard for it. And normally, I would suggest that goes at the top of the function. It doesn't have to, but there's a, something to be thinking about. We could, we could uh, bet, is this going to pass or not? Is this going to pass? For Maybe sure, right? We'll it. find out. Woo! Wonderful. So this is really simple. And a lot of you might be saying, well, why don't we just solve the whole problem? And the, the reason I do it this way is because we're not trying to learn how to solve this problem quickly. We're trying to learn how to interact as a group. You know, there will be times when we'll say, let's get to the solution quickly. But right now, we're just trying to see what it's like to interact as a group. I want everybody to be paying attention to how do you feel as we go. Let's get to this one. A five is going to turn into a V. Okay, so let's make a test. Test case for it first. Now, I have the habit of always saying whether I expect a test to pass or fail just before I run it. Because if you get a, a passing test the first time out, you probably didn't write a very useful test. But this we expected to fail, and it sure did. And how would you like to solve for it? Um, we can continue writing another if statement, yes. So while they're doing that, what is the right number of ifs to have in a method? What would somebody say? Appropriate number of ifs, zero. We're going to get there if we're here long enough. All righty, so it's passing. This is going awfully fast. 
Let's go ahead and do sick. Yeah, let's give him a hand. <laughs> Particularly Lynn and Yanka. It's the first time they've ever done this, and they're doing marvelously. Now, let's solve that the simplest way we can, and then we'll look for problems that we need to refactor. Okay, so six e uh, returns our, as we i. Let's make a test for that. It's a, a yes. This, again, it seems like such a simple exercise, but it's a good way to get used to this interaction. And as expected, failing. That's super good. Yes. And I'm wondering, do we start to see a pattern here? Um, let's, make, yeah, let's do one more, one more case if, if for six. Brilliant. So there's our timer. So that should pass. Let's rotate. And now we're at a junction because we have another kind of duplication happening. So Lynn, you're going to navigate this. Uh, I'm going to explain what I see as the problem and I'm going to let you think about how you might want to solve it. I want everyone here, including the, the, the observers, pay attention to how you feel about what's happening in front of us. Okay, the duplication is happening here. This is my observation. We're handling five, which is represented by a V on line 11. And we're handling five, which is represented by a V on line 14. I see that as duplication. Do you kind of see that? We're handling the same thing twice. Again, we're handling an I on line 14, and we're also handling a line on maybe an I on line five, maybe. Can you show that, Laura? A line up above line five? Yeah, and we're handling, handling I's again. So we're handling the same problem twice, and that's duplication. So when I was first taught test driven development, you, you do the simplest thing you can, and then you look for, a way to, um, look for a way to get rid of the code smells. You understand code smells, I hope. The, the, the things that indicate there might be a problem. And I was taught duplication was the big one to watch for. So that's what this is about. There are some more that I think are even more important now, but that's what we need to deal with. So I'm going to give you a chance to think about that and then uh, come, come up with some kind of an idea. What do you think we can do to... Re well, we already removed the duplication of checking for one, two, and three. And now we've got to figure out things like six, seven, eight, and so on. Give it a thought. Can we assign V for something? You get to decide what to try. And you could do it out loud so everyone can hear. But first of all, yeah, I, I take the role of the nine years old that you... Uh, You'll be a nine-year-old. That's okay. <laughs> I love this. I so as a nine-year-old, they are the nine-year-old is free to think any way they want to. But when we become adults, we constrain our thinking. We have need to release the inner nine-year-old, which most of us have trouble, I have trouble doing. So what would you like to try? So I see that in the Can line, you hold that up to um, you? I see the light 10, 11, so 5 would be V. So light 6, uh, I mean um, light 13 and 14, that return V, um, VI, that V can be assigned to something. So it can become like a common uh, variable. I love what you just said. That V could be assigned to something, so it becomes commonly useful outside of lines 10 through 12. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I would call that an accumulator. You might have a different terminology you would use because I'm pretty antique in my terminology. But can we fulfill that? Let's start with that. Um, so we can make a variable, like a, a constant. Um, I haven't come up with a proper um, solution, but, but that's the direction We'll learn by experimenting, to, yeah. right? So, so line three and a half? That's where you would put the accumulator. Yeah. Um, say V? I, I don't know what the to? keyword const yeah. does. What does the keyword const do? Um, so I think you have variables. Um, and that's a variable? It is a variable. Okay. But it, it doesn't move. Um, it's like, 
human. <laughs> Bear with me. Yeah, so uh, this is the, um, yeah, to, what do you think? I can uh, can Don't I worry, you just, you just, you're, lo you're coding out loud, and that's perfectly fine. Um, v, like a letter V. No, that one V is fine, and then we put it to big letter V. Does it make sense? That's up to you. Nobody's going to guide you. Be, you can't. They're not going to help. Sure. Don't help. Okay. <laughs> um, and then probably we have to write some instead of if uh, in the line 10 or I think 12 maybe. Uh, can we go down a little bit? Hmm. Mm. I think instead of if that we can do some uh, decrement in the in the number six instead of that six we can do um, can we do like v plus one uh, no I, I think in the if but I might be wrong the line number fifteen instead of number six human. Give me some courage. <laughs> like, I don't think that I'm the best coder in here, but I, I'm probably one of the bravest. <laughs> so I, first of yeah. all, we need to encourage Lynn. She's giving us a gift right now. That's the gift of seeing someone thinking out loud. And we often don't allow that to happen because it's very vulnerable. That you're brave enough to do that shows something about your character. That you're willing to think out loud when you don't know what to do. This is very valuable to us right now. So let's watch this happen. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe we hit control save and see what happened. I don't know. <laughs> so there is our, um, yeah. there's our timer, so we rotate. So now we're going to change our rules a little bit. We've been doing a coding dojo. And we started with David as the first navigator. And now he's back again, so we're gonna change it. Let's see how our time is doing. I think we're kind of right, we got about a half hour to open this out to more of what I would call mob programming. With mob programming, the observers aren't forced to be quiet. I had to do that when I would do user groups with this because otherwise everybody's shouting out their instructions. Go left, no, go right, go straight. You know, we're gonna get in an accident. We don't want to get into an accident. You would be, it'd be terrible to see that happen here. But now we're going to make it where it's more possible. But I want to ask an observation. When we were stumbling through things, how did that make you feel? How did it make you feel? Not so good. Can you put a word on that feeling? Anxious. Let's hear a couple more words. Frustrated. Mad. Okay, so I am the most easily frustrated, most anxious person you'll ever work with. I am just so, but when you're going to work with other people, you need to learn how to maintain a calm patience, not a kind of patience. So the purpose of the coding dojo for us was to have a calm way to learn together. And we did this for six months before we even stumbled upon the idea of actually working this way. And we learned how to keep our mouths shut and be calm about it. So that otherwise we're shouting out instructions and we're going to get in an accident. So we're going to change it to mob programming because the very first day we did mob programming, we'd been doing something like this coding dojo once a week for three hours every Friday, just on simple exercises of things the team wanted to learn about. And after that, we, somebody came to the, one of our team members came to the rest of the team and said, I'm working on something that I'm really having trouble with. Can we all get together and give me some ideas of what to do? We all got together in a room. We looked up at the, she started showing us the code. This person who is showing us the code was the team lead. When they hired me, they, she asked for me to come interview because she didn't want to become the manager of the team. They needed to hire a manager. She didn't want to be promoted to being a manager. She wanted to keep coding. So she came and said, Woody, would you please uh, 
apply for this job and you could become our manager. So she was the top person on the team and she was working on something that was too difficult. So she brought the team together. We started looking at it and almost immediately somebody looked at the code and said, could you scroll down through that method? This is I'm scrolling down on their mouse. Could you scroll a little more? Could you scroll some more? What's wrong with that method? Shout it out. Too long. Nowadays, we think 8, 10, 12 lines is a long method. Used to be maybe 50, but in my day, it's been 20 or so, a screen's worth of lines. So that person stood up and said, let's just refactor this. Because we were learning this thing called read by refactoring. Now, that wasn't called that in those days. But what it basically means, instead of trying to read a mess, just start refactoring it. It will clean itself up and then you'll understand it. So we started refactoring it. And it was exactly this process. We started following the coding dojo. But instead of limiting it to one person, so David might say, well, let's extract out this block. And we extract it out using the automatic tool that you get with Java or whatever. And it comes, but it comes with some weird parameters. And somebody else on the team said, wait a second, we don't want to pass all that stuff around. They started interjecting instead of having to stay quiet. We automatically knew we were there to help each other. That's what this is about, is collaborating. And this happened for us automatically, but we had learned to keep our mouths shut unless it's meaningful for us to speak. And I think if we hadn't been practicing that, mob programming would never have happened. There was a, a, at least 10 different things that we had been practicing that led us to do this. We didn't invent this. It just happened for us. So now, David, you can accept help from others. We're not necessarily going to make the person uh, navigate in order. We'll still switch the driver every couple minutes. But now anybody can be a navigator at any time. I think right now we'll have David navigate. And I'm going to put this chair back. So whoever's navigating will stand up to navigate. But if they just want to inform David, let me they notice something, they can point it out. So now it's not required that you stay quiet. You have to stay quiet because the audience isn't part of this, okay? You're just observing. So if you really see something so desperate you just can't control yourself, then we'll get medical help for you, okay? If you notice somebody sitting next to you and they're biting their lip and it starts a little bit bleeding, you know we have a problem, okay? Alrighty, so David, I'm going to set your timer, and we have exactly a half hour to see how this works. All right, Lynn, let's, uh, I've been thinking um, we can create in the top of the function a, a variable, like in the line four, maybe let. Uh, so what's the big idea? Uh, what let's create a variable um, that will be like a Roman, for example, and that Roman is going to we're going to return it at, uh, later. So we are going to work with a variable to build the correct uh, Roman number. So I would put it in these terms. The we have an accumulator that will store the Roman number we're going to return. I think that's what you're saying, David. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So that accumulator, we are going to manipulate it through the function. And it's going to start being an empty string. Uh, so it's is the default value at the beginning. And uh, the one that is failing is six. Yeah. No, sorry, it was seven, true? We, we don't have a failing test as such. What we have is a refactoring period. We're green, right. we can refactor. So let's go back to number six. And it's so we do have a failing test. Well, we do, but we didn't before because we had solved for it. We're refactoring. There should not be any failure. We've allowed it to become a failure. We probably need to get back to green right away. Yep. Uh, but you can interject yeah. anytime you want. Just put let's, it on the mic. Let's go to, to the case number where it used to be a six. Let's put back the number six and see that the tests are passing. And... Uh, you see what we've done here? We've gotten back to a green state. When you're doing refactoring, it's not red, 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 then green again. When we're refactoring, we stay green. They call that green to green. 
So you write a failing test, you make it pass, now you're gonna refactor, you keep it green. Nothing to do with mob programming as such. That's just TDD. So how would you like to deal yeah. with this? I'll put your timer back on. Yeah, the thing I was thinking that it, it will work better if we start to deal with the big numbers first and then... Uh, so go ahead and guide to do that. Yeah. So if, we, if you co uh, move the lines of, of the case number six uh, to the top of the function, and yes, line number five, that's good. And in, instead of just returning the number, we will uh, decrement Arabic in the line six and a half. So, sorry, type Arabic. Uh, um, space minus, minus equal six. Yeah, all together minus equal space six. And uh, the, in the next line, the Roman is, is going to uh, get appended or con concatenated. Uh, uh, but still, we don't want to return it. So we, we can remove the return. And Roman will be concatenated the, um, the well, yeah. Um, Roman plus equal. Uh, the string. Well, I think it's, it's better to do, deal with. Uh, you can put the number six in the uh, VI in, in Roman. Uh, but actually, the I's are going to be deal with them later. So right now, you could at least prove it's still yeah. passing Let's and see. see if it will, because I don't think it's going to work. We just need, let's get it, let's keep it green. We're not returning Roman ah, that's yet. Let's return so Roman we could do that at the bottom. At the yeah. bottom. I'm giving a little more direction because I know how much time we have. I normally wouldn't interfere. I know in the bottom of the function, so you go to the lines 18 and a half and return Roman there. Can you show to error, please? So these are passing and this failing. It's still six is... Uh, why, so why run, is run the test now, please. Yeah. Uh, command save to see if... Still is failing. Uh, what is returning? It is little down there the why it's failing. I have an hypothesis. Uh, you can talk, yeah. Because now we are not okay. anymore in the previous okay. pattern. Now everybody can contribute. Isuas, if you could go back to the converter, we're trying to assign to a constant right at the top. So we need to change it to be a let Roman equals something. Instead of const, let's put let. Now, that might be obvious to a lot of you, right? But this is sort of the advantage of this. If we're not familiar with it, somebody caught it. Now, okay, run the test. what's it saying? Run the test. Let's see what it should show in the terminal. What exactly is uh, failing? Okay, a bit more down. It was there. a bit more. Okay, it's, it's empty a string, so it's not entering in the if. Why is not? I think it's because the order of the, we have to refactor the function and I think it start top big numbers and deal each step. We rotate now. Now, okay, normally David could just continue uh, navigating. That's up to the team to decide. It's it, it just that whoever's sharing the idea, they're not gonna be at the keyboard. But I would say this would be a good time to rotate. And then we'll have Yanka take Take control. So you would stand up and you're going to navigate. Junk. And David will take the keyboard and we'll just keep, we're rotating the driver. Again, this is not a rule that you need to rotate. This is the way that we worked. I've seen teams do other ways. 
This is just one way. All right, I was thinking maybe go in a slightly different direction with this and just do a recursive call to it. Uh, like a recursive call and concatenate the result of that. So if, so like the idea is if we're between four and six, well, if we're five, return five, and then and everything that's less than four, glue it before, something like that. Ah, oh, God, I don't know how to say it out loud. Um. So I'm, I'm gonna point something out. We have on line um, 10, a case that is going to truncate the code. It will go drop into there and run that. And since Arabic is zero, we're yeah. gonna get kind of nothing back. That's the result we're seeing here. So I'm acting as a super uh, uh, compiler te or a t <laughs> test runner telling you what's actually happened. So what we need to do is understand what do we need to do with line uh, 10 so that no longer happens. And then we can move forward. With, I think your idea is brilliant and I think that basic concept could work. That's okay, that's okay. Mm. I think we should get, get rid of Roman altogether. Get rid of the let, at, no, keep this, get rid of Roman and stop returning at it at the end. Like get rid of the variable altogether, the one we added at the top. David, she's telling you something different than what you're inputting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and let's, um, let's get rid of the return at the bottom because obviously now that's, that's no longer gonna work. So at the bottom of the function, we're returning Roman. Let's get rid of this. And okay, go back to the top. And now what I'm thinking is something like... Did you run the tests? Every time we make a change, we run the tests. I expect to see a problem here. And you should read what the problem is. Yeah, okay. So make it return six, VI, uh, back on line six. Right. It'll always tell us what we did wrong. We good? Yeah, okay. <gasps> okay, back to green. Okay, so now I think the trick is going to be to make a recursive call. So let's go... At the, let's move this block lines four to seven to the bottom of the function. And now, 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 now. Okay, let's keep it simple for now. Let's try to see the pattern here. Let's go, let's, instead of doing return vi, let's go return, uh, what's our function called again? Answer, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's do return, return answer of um, Arabic minus five. <laughs> and then let's glue a V to the left of that. Are we, are our tests passing? I would like to see the terminal a little bit. They're gonna be passing in we're, a we're second. We're gonna fail for a moment <laughs> while we're changing this one uh, bit. Right. So to the left of this, uh, let's go, oh, we can, do, uh, before that, we can just, uh, so move the cursor to, uh, let's go, go, answer of five plus answer of this whole thing. <laughs> yeah, let's just glue the strings together. Yeah, okay. We should still be passing. Are we not passing? Why not? What? <laughs> negative, negative repeat, is this it? So, uh, it, it may not be oh, able to why are we, why are we decrementing Arabic uh, up there on line 14? <sighs> okay, there we go. <laughs> You never wanted to see inside the mind of a programmer, but now you have. 
And this is something like, I feel like this is sort of what we need to get this code into, because with, from what I remembered about Roman numbers, I don't know if I'm allowed to draw on that knowledge for the purpose of this exercise. Do whatever you want. Okay, so, because with, it's like you put the ones you subtract on the left and you put the ones you add on the right. So it's something like, um, need to, if we're less than five, we need to put the eyes on there. And if we're more than five, we need to put those eyes on there, something like that. Can you draw the idea that you have? Maybe. I'm going to tell you something I learned a long time ago. The power of a programmers standing and working at a whiteboard. What a great thing this can be. Or really bad, but we'll see. Okay, so if we're bigger than three, we're relative to There's our timer. It's now, that like doesn't mean this. you have to stop navigating, but we are going to rotate the driver. So I think the question for the team now is, would you like to allow uh, Yanka to continue navigating for a while? In which case, uh, uh, Laura, you would become the driver. Now again, a timer isn't necessary. I've worked with teams, we don't use a timer. A timer just how, happened to be how we did our coding dojos and it grew into our mob programming practice. But I've worked with teams who don't use a timer. You just switch the driver out when somebody says, I don't want to type anymore. Or somebody else says, I'd like to type for a while. That's okay to do. Okay, I think I know how we should do this. Let's go like, um, if it's less than five, let's glue the let's call ourselves recursively and do it on the left and add it, concatenate it onto the left. Yeah. So I'd like to hear the bigger picture. We're coding out loud. What's the big picture of what we're trying to do? So the big, big picture is this garbage I drew on the... Okay, so, <laughs> so the big picture is if it's, if it's um, greater than five, we're gonna add something but if it's less than five, we're going to glue gonna it onto the left. To it? So if a three would have a V on it? No, we need to put the block after those ones so that we don't match that. So we need to so, stick that onto the end. So yeah, the bigger picture is something we want to kind of have. In what case would we do this? Four. <laughs> so, and we already have a way of doing four. So I'm going to give a little guidance here. We have a lot of what I would consider duplicate code in here. And that's the big smell I'd be wanting to remove. But we're not going to worry about it. I think if you've got something here you think will work, I'd like to see what happens with it. Let's see what happens. Okay, so let's move the sift to the bottom of the function because otherwise we're going to hit the... Yeah. And let's move above this bit, maybe. Yeah. Or under it. Doesn't really matter. Okay. And then now we return answer of Arabic minus five plus answer and, uh, after the after the because we're concatenating the strings, yeah of five. I'm trying to still not sure how to. This should give us four, and then we can change the stuff after it to be if Arabic is greater than six or greater than five yeah yeah greater than five yeah. i was being part of her brain <laughs> and this should buy us up to eight which is some progress can we take a look uh, at the code that we have up above now yeah so do we still need 10 through 12 um we need 10 through 12 we need v oh we're, we're not doing, we don't need seven through nine. All righty. So if we run a test for eight, we'll prove it's working correctly for eight. All right. Let's go out a test for eight. Right. So we don't, I don't normally write a green test, but I, I'd like to see that this works. But I'm not sure that's really legitimate test driven. I'm sure it is. I'm not an expert. Uh, missing an, uh, yeah.
But wherever we're going, I'm loving it. Yeah. So I, I would give you the next problem as your product uh, owner. Don't do that. So we did eight, and eight goes to that. And so we're going to do nine now, which goes to IX. Can we do 10 first? You want to do 10 first? Because it's the pattern. You add it like you subtract on the left. So I'm going to point out something here. You are all developers. Tell your product owner what to do. OK? That's what we just demonstrated. It'll be much easier if we do this, she said. So that's what we're doing. Oh, I accidentally got the wrong timer going here. So let, no, let's continue on. I, I, uh, I have a, we're getting near the end timer. That's not like the end of the world, just the end of this session. So we're good. This wasn't her timer. We're good. This was a different timer. Yeah, let's add a case for 10. Sorry for the mic breathing, guys. So I want you all to understand, you're not going to rush to put this into LinkedIn. We talked about, like, I now know how to convert Roman numerals. That, that's not something you want on your resume. The purpose of doing this simple exercise is so we can see the process. And let's uh, add a straightforward case for, for 10. Oh, and we can get rid of 7, 8, 9, because that's no longer needed, I'm sure. So let's, let's, okay, let's add 10 first, then remove that, because otherwise we'll, our, our tests will fail. So just do if Arabic equals 10, uh, return x. Oh, it doesn't matter, I don't think. Well, so this is a good, so there was a point made. Oh, maybe it does. You have to push the button. Maybe it does. I'm sorry. Uh. No, I was asking if we should do the 10 in the bottom because then the logic um, follows. So that's a good feed. That's good information. So we're going to continue with what was there. See if that passes. Move it if we need to. But this is exactly the kind of interchange you want. Everybody's thinking about what's concerns to them. And that's what we're doing here. Okay, let's go remove four, four first. So 12 uh, to whatever. No, 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 not this. Just uh, the, the, the special case we have for and four. line 12. On line 12 and the next three lines, yeah. I believe we can get rid of this, I think. The, the ifs. How come? The seven, 16 to 18 should be handling that. Shouldn't it? Um. Wait, five minus Arabic, I think. So on line 17. Yeah, on line 17, we need to do it, make it five minus Arabic, I think. Because we're going into negatives. Uh, not this one, the one on the left. So we're having a little bit of trouble communicating. We get used to this. So instead of Arabic minus five, it would be five minus Arabic. So if we say it in a full sentence, then we understand what we're trying to hear. But this is, we're talking about Wheel's Law. We instantly prove whether the communication happened or not. This still feels Thanks like a hack, that. but uh, sir. Sure. Um, this is how you code when you're doing it alone. We're just doing it as a team. So there's the timer for rotating the driver. Would somebody else like to? Would you like? Uh, I think that we're probably to the point where someone else understands how to navigate. So I've got to make a, a learning session out of this. Um, the goal of the next navigator is to continue the idea that we're already trying. If we get to a point where we're starting to see a lot of code smells, we might want to start saying, what can we do differently? But until then, so right now we have a bunch of duplicate, but I think a lot of you can see that we could probably turn a lot of this into a map eventually. There would be ways to get rid of the duplication so we don't have a bunch of ifs. How many ifs are appropriate? What a lot of people see nowadays is one decision per method is more than enough. And we would get there that way. But there's lots of ways to do it. So if you feel good handing off the navigation to someone else, and anyone else can now navigate, it's up to whoever wants to navigate that would do that. Um, I so, just, 
I just kind of want to reflect on the code because um, we have already some function, but I'm not sure if we have a good logic here, as I said earlier. And, and just the more we write, it just bugs me a little bit in, in how we structure things. So maybe we can reflect again. Sure. The and I can, you can go and no, just look at it together. Yeah. Um, so we have first smaller and equal to three, and then we have number 10 right there. I don't think that it's a very good place to put uh, equal to 10 right there. So maybe um, that line 16, yeah, it can go all the way down for now, I think. So we're thinking here of making it kind of just logically ordered. Yeah, just yeah. in that sense. I don't, I'm not recording or re... Right. Yeah. Uh, I think so, yeah. And uh, it's true, yeah. But um, because it's right in the middle, <laughs> it just bugs me. Um, yeah. So we're making a lot of changes without running any tests. So I think we're going we're gonna to probably need to slow down just a little bit. Where does that belong? Yeah, I don't know how people code in team in, in, in reality. So I think I just put my input. input yeah, right so we, we say this, and is that the right place for that is the question. Um, Other team members can interject. Yeah. I think it can go up, but yeah, what do you think? Like um, up one step. Yep. Yeah. I, I like to think about it from bigger numbers to less numbers, so, mm, but... Uh, from bigger to small, I think there's a problem because he keep increasing the number yeah. and we never have like a... So you, you're going to code like top bottom True. in that sense. So in this case, maybe at line 11 and a half, you would paste that? Because the yeah. logic above line now, line 14, is whatever's passed in, what do we do with this character? And then um, I think that it's a good time to uh, run the tests if you didn't already. So now we just, we have the, law, the correct order and at the right place. Half of what coding is, is doing things in the right order, right? Am I wrong about that? It's like a lot of it, you guys just gotta do it in the right order. So we've got, <laughs> we've got only uh, seven minutes left, but are we ready to continue on? Do we wanna try? Something like um, an 11 or a 14. Yes. See what happens? I saw a not yes. Want to write a test for, let's do a test for nine because we still didn't um, deal with nine. Uh, so maybe the, yeah, then fix the line 27 instead. We tested the same thing. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the way. Um, yeah. Did we say but we should nine? be doing nine we, first. We said, let's, we said nine, yeah. let's do nine first. We can c just control. Because we haven't Z. we haven't coded for nine and then yet. Control ship Z. <laughs> it's a letter. Yeah. 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 Whoever invented these keyboards, they got to. <laughs> I want to talk with them. <laughs> I wonder the same thing when I first moved to Finland. Um, well, maybe not just Finnish like... keyboards. Any keyboard. <laughs> There's got to be a better way. There you go, yeah. The order doesn't matter that much. Yeah. It'll run the tests in some order. Can we see the 31st line? I think it should be good. Yeah, I think it should That's be good. That's all correct. I think we need Shall to we see what do we, how do we want to yes. solve for that. Can we save and see? Oh, okay. And we should be. Can we see, yeah. Now I wonder, what's the logic for nine then? We don't have it. We decided the test we don't have it. So it's something like this or something higher. Yeah. No? So David, do you want to navigate? Yeah, I, I can start. Okay. I'm just, I'm just typing here. Okay. Yep. I guess we don't want the driver it giving It enters items. the flow in the number, line number 17, where it's above five, yeah. but it's not 10. So I guess we could create a new if block. Mm, yeah, it can be in the line 12 and a half. Well, let's, let's hard code it first and then think about it. Uh, if I write equal nine, then 
return, you know. So this is the way I typically would work. Just get it greed and then think about it. Let's return the correct value. Tell her the new value. IX. Let's see the tests. Yeah, but it's true that I start to, to appear some code smells, a lot of duplication. So I think sooner or later we have to think how to put this code more tighter. Yeah. Um, but it's passing. So I don't know if we should. I think we've think done about... enough coding. Yeah. Because we have four minutes left. Well, we were having fun here. So we'll wrap it up. So here's a problem with this. Nobody wants to stop until it's done. Yes. Have you ever had it where this has actually happened to me? I'd come home because this was before I was programming for a living. I'd come home and get right to the computer and start programming. And my wife would come in. Uh, we worked together. We owned a business together. So she'd come in and say, I'm going to make some dinner. Oh, great. So then she comes in and says, dinner's ready. And I just keep going. I'll be right there. And then she'll come and say, I'm going up to bed. So it's like three hours later. And I said, I'll be right up. And I just keep coding. And then she comes downstairs. She says, it's time to go to work. What about dinner? What about sleep? Have you ever had that happen to you? I just didn't even pay attention to the time. I went without dinner. I went without sleep. And now I have to go to work. At least I don't have to get dressed because I'm already ready to go. But this is sort of what happens. We don't want to stop until we get a good stopping spot. But we're going to stop here. All we've been demonstrating is how we can start interacting together. We need to have some techniques to use. We need to have some practices to follow. We need to learn to not talk all the time. We need to learn to talk when it's appropriate to talk. We have to learn not to change. Have you ever heard this saying, change horses in the middle of the stream? I'm not sure exactly where that came from. But the idea is, I think if you're taking your wagon across the river, and then you're going to change horses in the middle of the stream. Not such a good thing to do. And so that's the thing. If we start in an idea, we take it to its logical end. And if we go, this isn't really getting us anywhere, then we try something else. I can see how this will grow for a while, but I also see some patterns developing. I like seeing patterns. So there, we have places to go with this. Now, some of you already know a better solution, but I bet you there's 50 solutions to this. My father used to say, there's a thousand right ways to do anything. We must never think ours is the one right way. And I think that really helps when we're trying to collaborate. I want to give a big hand to our volunteers. Thank you. I have, a, I have, for, you, I have for you a present from Wunder, uh, one back for Lintu and for Janka. Thank There's you. There's two there. <laughs> Woody and Laura, they got theirs before. We that. got ours earlier. Thank you. But so thank you so very much. I've had a wonderful time here. I'm planning on being here, you know, the rest of the evening. If you have questions or want to talk to me or tell me what I'm wrong about, I'm happy to hear any of that. And also, uh, Follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn is really good because I'll follow you back. I, I've already following too pe many people in Twitter. But you can tell me what I meant by what I said. Okay, that would be really helpful to me. So thank you all very much. We can all take a bow. Thank you. I hope that was helpful.